but he's called us to more. Uh, and the beauty of it is there are, even if we wanted to study war, there are principles that um, Grant and Lee, and if we wanted to even go farther back, Napoleon and others, that you, you, you could draw from and learn and know, and the great generals probably in West Point, even now there's probably um, cadets learning some of the principles that were taught years gone by, but not to stay there when it comes to how we look at warfare now. And I thought about that when, it, when I thought about um, what, what we're living in now, and this is that, vet, remember we talked about it, Veterans Day was on uh, Friday of this past week. On Tuesday, a game came out. And I just want to give you an idea of something that's just big in, in, in our culture right now. A game came out called Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. And I want you to see the trailer. It's just a minute long. So if you could show that. And I, so I thought about that these are the times that we're living in. To think about that we are now living in 2011. War is war, but some things have changed. We still wrestle not with flesh and blood, the Bible says. There's a spiritual warfare going on. I was, you, you look at something like this and you think, is that this thing that big of a deal? Right now, at, within 24 hours of going on sale, that game sold 6.5 million copies in the United States and the United Kingdom. And so when we talked about last week, when we were talking about the fact that, um, that we, there's sometimes in church circles, they hesitate to use the, the metaphor of war, the world's not afraid to use it or talk about it. And on uh, Tuesday, actually during the day, some of the times I get opportunity to substitute teach, I was actually subbing at the high school on Tuesday and had discussion with uh, a young man in one of the classes about the game because what happens is people will line up by the hundreds in front of GameStop and Walmart and other places to get this game at midnight when Tuesday rolled around. And it's a social event. They're, they're enjoying that time. They'll get their lawn chairs out and they'll set up and they're ready. And then even as they're driving home, they're having a, one of them rip it open out of the plastic so that they can get the game in as quickly as possible. And if you, they're on the screen, you could see if they, had, they have it for different games, you can see maps of the world, a map of the world, and lights on how many people are playing that game. Millions of people playing this game. And so it's on their mind. They're willing to, to think about warfare. They're willing to, to um, have that be a, a priority. And even in my discussion with one of the young men, I said, how do you think our country would do in battle with other countries? Let's say we got attacked. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Red Dawn. It came out in the late 70s. It was a, it was a movie that was saying, teaching or making you think about the fact, what if... What if, what if America was attacked? Because we've just been so blessed. I mean, the, the thing that happened with 
it was horrend horrendous, horrible thing that happened. But we didn't have troops landing and battle going on here. Yeah, thank God. But I, I, just millions of thoughts came to my mind as I, as I was thinking about this whole concept that Rome in its heyday never thought they would be conquered. And now if you were to drive through Rome, there's ruins of the Colosseum and there's ruins of this. And so, and if the Lord tarries, who knows what would happen to our country? And God has called us to this time. And what do we do with it? What is the battle? I'm not, this isn't my attempt to get everybody ready to sign up and list, okay? At least in the physical army. But I am challenging you as Christians, do you realize we're in a battle? We are in warfare. And, and the weapons sometimes change. Or at least it seems so. God's called us to more, and He's given us principle, principles, timeless principles, so that we can be effective in this war that He's called us to. And so I, I want to pray, and then I want to look at these. We had one that we talked about last week, and we'll we'll review it. And then I would like to encourage you to think biblically when it comes to this thing called uh, the battle. Um, because when it's all said and done, I want my commander-in-chief to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So let's pray. Fathers, we look into your word. We thank you for the grace that you've poured out on our country to be able, even able to, to conceive of the fact of of how long it's been. We are blessed. But with that blessing comes a huge responsibility. And the philosophies that would undermine, that would attack, that would, would um, uh, affect and infect our lives and our homes and our neighborhoods and our communities I'd ask you, God, that we'd be aware of the deceiver and not be deceived. And, and as a result of looking at the principles that you've shown us in your word, you didn't tell us these stories just so that we would nod our head and say, boy, those were amazing people back then. You did it so that when we read them, we would say, and how does this play out in Warren County? How does this work so that when it's all said and done, we can step back and say, God, we are honoring you at Grace Bible Church to what you've called us to do. And even as millions of games were sold, we realize we're not in a game. This is real life. This is real life for the, for the hearts and minds of people. And I'd ask you, God, that we would not be in a retreat mode that we would not be people that want to constantly pull back out of the battle and, and we want to live in, in an idea of retreat, but that we would be people that would engage. And because we have you, and because we have the sword of the Spirit, and we, because we put on the armor of God. So God, would you help us now as we, as we look in, once again into the war room? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 13, please open your Bible to that. And if you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible right there in front of you in the pew rack before you, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, something that I like to do, I like to win. Do you like to, I don't know how many of you uh, play the game. You know, I just play to play, play to exist. But how boring. He's called... God's called us on a, um, a team, and it's a winning team. It's a winning, winning army. I want you to look at a verse here as, as Jesus is talking to Peter, who is um, the, the spokesman of the apostles, and he says, you, Peter, um, which means rock, rocky, small, little rock, 
Upon this rock, Jesus is talking about himself. Look at this, Matthew uh, 16, verse 18 with me. And he tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. And look, look at this, this is so cool. You want to win? Pick church. Church wins. Okay, look at that. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're going to win. Amen? You're like, you're like, yeah, I believe you. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. And there's some people that are, they live to criticize the church. They live to criticize it. And by the way, we have dropped the ball at times. We have failed. There are scandals. There are situations that, would, that, that are embarrassing. But the church that God has called, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that is the, where the battle is. It is a demonic, supernatural battle going on. Do you believe me? It's the truth. It's the truth. I don't know if you've ever felt it. Some cultures, are they can talk about this supernatural stuff. They can just jump into it because they're very much aware of the spirit world that's going on. Sarah and I, Sarah got home this weekend. We just had a great talk. Right when she gets through the door, right away, we're just engaging, which is cool. And uh, start talking about some cultures are so receptive to that. We have been so blessed with a materialistic, and I don't mean that just with money. I'm talking about just how we look at things matter-wise that we shun or we for years have put off the supernatural, not realizing there's other cultures and revivals are breaking out in these cultures because they're receptive to the Holy Spirit. Some churches that are in America today, if the Holy Spirit showed up, didn't show up, they'd still be doing fine with church because it's just become a da 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 which I don't know what that means, but I said it, right? <laughs> But God, and we'll see the Holy Spirit. You'll see him throughout um, the book of Acts here. But look at this. Um, the first point for our message here was look at the leaders. So we talked about that. God's called many of us to be leaders. Each of us is leaders in some way or another in the worlds that we're put in, the spheres of influence that we're on. Secondly, I want you to look at the, the mission. Look at the mission. Look at verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, look at this, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Worshiping, this, this, this admitted, uh, originally meant to discharge a public office. Uh, biblically, it was a priestly service. And God is the audience for all worship. And some of you may be looking and going, yeah, but the priest thing is done. It was interesting when I was subbing, the conversations you get into in classes. It's just priceless, and, and I want to be receptive to it. And this one class didn't have as many people. And by the way, when you have less people, sometimes it's harder. I don't know if you know that as in a teacher situation. Sometimes if, you're just, if you've stacked all the bodies in, you can keep them in line, you know. But if there's like a few out here, they start to figure out how can we take advantage of the substitute. I'm glad I never did that. <laughs> so in one point, I'm in this class, and this girl says, hey, we've had you before. Aren't you a priest? <laughs> and I go, no, I get to be married. <laughs> and I like it that way. All right? Um, and, she, and then she said it again, you know. The whole, but the, actually, she's biblically right. I'm a priest, and if you're a Christian, so are you. You're part of a royal priesthood. In fact, Hebrews talks about it. This is what we're called to when it comes to worship, the priestly duty that we're called to. Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. Look at this. Through him then... This is, remember, that whole book is about Christ, and Christ is better. Christ is preeminent. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do, and so that's an act of worship. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. 
for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Yesterday, those of you that were involved in that ministry of, of um, feeding these individuals that were coming and these families that were coming, that's, that was an act of worship to God. Pack in that. That was an act of worship to God. Um, I, I could go on and on. Do you look at your life like that? Every bit of life, act of worship, fixing a meal for your family, going to work, providing money so that your family could have what it has, act of worship. And if, you start, if we start looking at life that way, then it has bearing on how I'm living this life, what I'm doing, what, I'm, what, what, what are my entertainment um, values. What, you could go on and on. If I look at it, every aspect of it is an act of worship. It's, what a great way to live. It, by the way, it can drain you if you let it. But there's times where if you stop and think, God, you have to do this. You, you, you have to do this. There's so many different ways of looking at this. Um, what, what realm do you live in most often? Let me, let me, what I mean by that is this. First, there's like three realms. I mean, there's all different ways to look at it, but just for a moment, just humor me. There's first of all that sinful realm of, of just sin. Just, and, and I hope that as a Christian, God in his grace obviously has pulled us out of that. Okay? So that shouldn't, the, the living, living here, I understand if we visit there every now and then, it's like, what am I doing here? God, help me out of there, okay? But, and by the way, if there's a Christian that lives here constantly, something's up. Something's up. Then there's the natural the natural life, where it's, I've got talents, I've got abilities, I, I've received Christ. And by the way, so I'm, I'm mentioning all the good things. And then I've also got other things that aren't that great, but as a Christian, I, I succumb to them sometimes and, and um, flirt with that, and, and, um, and that's the natural. And by the way, I listed the good things too, because some of us might go, oh no, but that would, wouldn't that be over here? No, there's some good things. And do you remember when Adam and Eve sinned? Remember what was the fruit was called? Uh, what tree was it called? The fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. God has to sanctify even my goodness. And there's some people that's like, and here's where a lot of Christians live. They live in this realm all the time, and they think that's fine. Because I'm good. But there's people that are in the sin thing that actually have natural talents and abilities and things along the line. And here's what he's called you and me to. The spirit-filled life. Where he actually takes, you're talented at this and you're good at this, and in an amazing way, I'm going to even make it more amazing for my glory. Because if I just stay here, guess who gets the glory? Me. And over the years, the, the, the hard part about it is God's gifted you. He's given you different things. And you start to get good at it. You're good at it. And after a while, you don't even need to talk to him anymore. You're so good at it. Like, something I feel very confident with, and I mentioned it before, I can walk into the high school, and I just love these kids. And I actually know how to talk to them. And it's like... Well, zippity doo da, all right. But there's some people that, that they have no interest in that at all. But I do. I'm, I'm just into it. And I could do that unless God killed me. I could do that without Jesus because I've been doing it for years. But guess what? Every time I do, it's real stupid. Because after a while, here's what will happen. Somebody's going to start making my life interesting in that classroom. And if it's just me, I'm going to start getting angry or start getting worked up. Or so, or, and the real Mark, with all of his talents and abilities, is going to mess up. 
But if Christ is leading me, if Christ is it, and I'm constantly giving, and I'm saying to him, I want to use these talents and abilities for you, great. Because I, I'm trying, I want this to be practical when we're thinking about this mission. Let's think about Pujols, Albert Pujols. He's naturally an amazing baseball player. I mean, he steps in. I know he had one really good game. You could go through all this stuff and whatever, contract. I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking, and this is a person who claims Christianity. So I'm thinking, how does this play out for Albert? Because you might look at Mark Myers and go, well, of course you're into that Jesus thing. It's kind of your job. But what about me? What about, what about me? And so for a moment, I know you aren't Albert Pujols, but he's got a job that honestly, he hits a baseball. He catches a baseball. And some of you are like, hey, he's pretty good at it. What are you saying? Right. I'm not on him, but I'm saying it's not, it's not necessarily something that's spiritual. And yet it is. And what I mean by that is this, and I, and I could do it with every one of your jobs. He needs to be in the batting cage. And he needs to practice picking up a ball. But each time that he steps on, you know, I know, people say afterwards he's doing this stuff and all those, I understand that. But it's even more than that. It's him saying, God, I want to glorify you in everything that I do. And when I start to lose sight of it, this is when I get in trouble. And in your job, and in your parenting, and in your marriage, and in your helping around the house, and in your schoolwork, and in your... Are you ever seeking God so that your life isn't just... It, I'm not... Golly, I didn't kill anybody today. But you're staying here, and he's saying, I want to set you apart for this amazing mission so that all these things that you're actually really good at, and even in your weakness, I will fill you, and I'm going to impact lives through you. What an exciting way to live. And we'd start looking at life like that. Because he's called us to a mission. This whole idea of fasting is connecting with passion and prayer. It's so concerned with the spiritual issues that you can't even eat. You ever felt like that? I know some of you did when you first fell in love. I can't eat. It's, I'm so, it's a great diet program, but you die after a while. You got a certain point, I got to eat. All right. But that, this is, this is you're your, your thinking so seriously about things of God that you're, that you're like, God, I want to follow you. It's, it's such an amazing time. So God moves this church to set apart individuals for special work. And so Saul and Barnabas uh, are set apart because the Holy Spirit says, this is what I want them to do. Verse 3. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This is the church pattern. Praying seriously. Have you prayed seriously? When's the last time you prayed seriously? Dad, there's an issue that arises. You are so good at fixing things. Have you prayed about it? So this church, they prayed seriously, and then they, they commissioned them and sent them away. Let them go. They released them. And by, by the way, I love this too. It says, set apart, uh, back in verse 3, verse 2, I'm sorry, set apart for me. Isn't that cool? The Holy Spirit says, I'm going to be with them in this thing. It's not set them apart and then I'm going to send them out. It's set apart for me. I'll, I'll be going with them. I'm going to be doing this thing called ministry, this mission. Verse 4, so, once again, shows up, being sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. God sends them. They leave Antioch. They go to Seleucia, located about 16 miles away. It served as a port of Antioch. Once there, they sailed to Cyprus. Cyprus was the third largest island in the Mediterranean, Sicily, Sardinian, then Cyprus, 60 miles off of the Syrian coast. This was Barnabas' home. 
would have been familiar territory, had a large Jewish population. I love in this how we see um, God giving someone the desires of your heart. There's so many ideas sometimes about God that, that are sad. Like God lives to make us miserable. Oh, I, can't, I don't know if I want to say yes to God. He might make me, I don't know, and I don't even fill in the blank, but it's something negative. And yet I see here Barnabas, he's delighting himself also in the Lord, and God gives him the desires of his heart. And you could imagine that one of the desires of his heart is to impact Cyprus, because that's where he's from. And so he's being faithful to the ministry God's called him, and then the Holy Spirit says, I want you to give me some guys to, to do ministry, and Barnabas is one of them. And God in his grace goes, hey, I'm going to send you back home. I'm going to send you back to people that you love so that you can have a man. Isn't that great of God? This is God's heart. If you, if you have a negative idea about God, I'd ask you to talk to him about that. Some of you, maybe it's because you had a bad father figure, and so the whole idea of father in your mind is a negative thing. Whatever the reason, maybe in your mind he burned you. Maybe he let you down, and I don't know if I can completely trust him. That's not God. God can be trusted. Look at verse 5. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. They arrived at the main port city to preach the gospel first to Jews, and that was Paul's custom throughout his missionary journeys. And then this one John Mark, he is a helper. We'll hear more about him as we work through Acts together. He's a native of Jerusalem. He's a cousin of Barnabas. And so God is even having family members start to, to step in and be a part of this mission. That's just exciting. Are you praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ and those that are physically in your family? You might be looking at your brother. You might be looking at your sister and you're, you're like concerned about them. Are you praying for them? Are you, are you asking God uh, to do work in their hearts? And then ultimately down the road, five years down the road, ten years down the road, you're, God puts you in ministry together and you're like, man, I, I always like, we always get in fights at home. How is this working? And it's because God uh, does it. So look at the mission. Point number three, look at the enemy. Once these great things start to happen, and I don't know if you've ever had these weeks where just some great things start to happen, I'm telling you, get ready. This is real life. Get ready. And it's okay. You just need to be aware of it. Some of us have phrases for that. They go, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. It's I'm waiting for... It's just your... This is just real life. Because if you're doing what God wants you to do, if we're in a battle, the enemy doesn't like it. Look at the enemy. Look at um, verse 6 with me. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos... They came upon a certain magician, a Jewish, Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. They had gone throughout the whole island. This Paphos, let me describe this to you. This is a great center for the worship of Aphrodite or Venus. The greatest festival in Cyprus in honor of Aphrodite was the Aphrodisia. Does that sound familiar? You ever hear that word before? Aphrodisia. Held for three days each spring... It was attended by great crowds, not only from all parts of Cyprus, but also from surrounding countries. It was packed with immorality. And this is what God's called them to. This is why in my prayer I was mentioning the whole idea of retreat. And if we're not careful, we, we love retreat. We love the field of dreams. And God's called us. There, there are times of retreat, but he's called us to the battle. And so there in the capital, they found this magician, Bar Jesus, son of salvation. That's what his word means, his name means. This is a false prophet. Verse 7, look at verse 7. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. This Bar-Jesus, um, 
He, he had attached himself to the Roman proconsul. The Roman governor was Sergius Paulus. This is a smart man, the Bible says here. He wants to learn more, so he calls on Saul and Barnabas. I tell you, you and I are coming in contact with people all the time that God has placed in them a heart. It's God that's done this work of searching. They're trying to figure out life. If they don't, the reason that we are know any of this stuff is it's God. God put us in church. God put us in families that that love the Lord or or somebody came across our path. It's not because we're so smart. And it, it's humbling when you stop and, and look at life that way that God in your grace you just reached in. And we've got this Sergius Paulus that, that's a leader and he's got this guy, um, this bar Jesus guy spending time with him. And it's almost like he's trying to figure out the supernatural life, or there's got to be something more. I mean, I, I've done, I lead in Rome, and I've got this power, but there's got to be something more. And, and this guy's talking, and he's got some things here that seem to make sense to me. But then he hears about Barnabas and Saul, and they come across this path, and he goes, I want to talk to them too. And you and I are coming across people constantly that... God's doing that work, and you might see it. Yeah, but look who he hangs around with. Look who that guy's hanging around with. They're hanging around with people that are like into the occult. They're hanging around with people that have philosophies that I just don't agree with. But that person, God may be working on them. And you would look at them and go, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Because they're just so not God. And that person may be closer to hearing what the gospel has to share. And the person that you think, boy, they're just so nice and they seem godly and they're churchy. They may be so far because they think they got it all figured out. So we got this one that's got this magician attached to him. Not, not strapped to him, but he's, he's there. And he sees Barnabas and Saul and he hears about it and he's like, I'm interested. So let's keep going on with the story, what happens here. But Elimus, the magician, so that's another name for Bar-Jesus here, for that is the meaning of his name, Elimus, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And so you've got this, if you could just imagine, you've got this friend in school or friend in your family or, or friend in your neighborhood or just however, work, whatever. And this person seems to be seeking God doing something. And then there's this other person that is totally into, we still wrestle not with flesh and blood, this person could get saved, but this person doesn't have interest in things of the Lord, but this person seems to be like, something's up, and they want to talk to you. Get ready, there might be a battle, because this person still likes them as a buddy, and they don't want to lose them. So pray for both. But understand, you're in a battle. I want you to look at the victory. Look at the victory, last point, because this need, we need to be encouraged in this thing. Um, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Look at verse 9. But Saul, who was also called Paul, Look at this again. Here's the key. It's not this middle life, my natural ability. Saul was smart. He was talented. He was gifted. And guess what he said in Philippians about this stuff? I count it as dung. That's a nice word to communicate something really gross. This, and he's talking about his talents. He's talking about what he's good at. He's talking about his free throw percentage. It was in the 80s. He's talking about the, the degrees he had on his wall. He's talking about um, his musical, musical capabilities. He's talking about the fact that he can do constructive things really well. And when he does woodwork, it's so beautiful. He says, without Christ, I count it. All these things can be used for God's glory. But without Christ, it's rubbish. It just lifts me up. Filled with the Holy Spirit, now he has a discernment that is amazing. Look at this. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, I don't know if we could ever do this, okay? We'll also call it filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, so he looks at him. The Spirit of God is what made that discernment possible. Look at verse 10. And said, You son of the devil, 
You enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Satanic thought is full of deceit and villainy. Deceit, dolos, it's a snare. Villainy, recklessness, unscrupulousness, wickedness, son of the devil, enemy of all righteousness. And so when I'm, you know, once again, I'm because was, I was there this week, as I'm walking the halls of Warrington High School and I'm looking, and I'm looking at all the things that are going on, and my heart breaks for certain young people because of what they would, th they would value as, as something. If I can just be with this person next to this locker, kissing them, this is what's going to give me dignity and value. And guess what? Maybe next week it'll be with somebody else. But a philosophy keeps telling them, this is where you get your value. This is what's important. And I'm walking through there, and I could just be that 50-year-old guy walking through and going, well, ain't that interesting. But I stop and I think to myself, what was Mark like at that age? What was I struggling with and dealing with? And, and then I think of my wife, Kim, when she was that age, what she was dealing with. And, and if we forget what God has called us from, we'll just be judgmental of all these people. And I just picked one instance, let alone the conversations that are going on because I'm a sub, and they think, well, I can talk about anything. I won't get in trouble. And I'll say it nice and loud. Or as I walk past lunch tables and I'm hearing different things and it's just philosophies it's just this is where I get value and maybe if I'm with this person this will be the most important thing and I could look back and go boy was I I thought that was important but guess what this happens in adult worlds I could go through the, the cafeteria where you're spending time and some of the things that's the that's what's important or the college guys that when I'm in a softball league down in Marthasville and I'm waiting for the next game and I just plant myself because I want to hear what's important. And I'm, that, that's the thing? That's the thing that would even come out of your mouth as important? But guess what? They're putting all of their heart, because out of the mouth, all of their heart is invested in that. And I, by the way, I could even go one step further. What about what comes out of my mouth? What about what I value? There's a battle for my heart. So I could, we, please do not just make it a, a high school thing or, a, or a, guy, a bunch of guys playing softball. Put it in your realm. Take the time to listen. I, I come in contact with people, older people at Walmart. Guess what they all, they're talking about? Boy, it's going to be a hot one today. Yeah, guess what? You said that yesterday. <laughs> this is it? This is it? Let alone economics and politics and, and all the stuff that we have to talk about at some point. But we're putting all, we're sliding all the chips on that. And God says, you got to look at it because it's real life. But here's what I want you. I want you to look at it through spiritual eyes because my ways are not your ways and my thoughts aren't your thoughts. And then I start to, then I start to, man, this, that's why you put that person in my life. That's why. And just say, God, I, want, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. I want to see these things. God, you got to help me. And that discernment comes through the Holy Spirit. So you and I, unless we want to get locked up, because I, I, I even talked to the youth group about this on Wednesday night. I can't go by the one going, you are wasting your time on a false philosophy by making out in front of this locker. <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm walking out, I really did speak righteousness. <laughs> as, enter the paddy wagon. Right. Do they have paddy wagons in Warrington? <laughs> yeah, I'll see you on Thursday, yeah. Oh. oh, Lord. Let's keep going. All right, here. So I can't, I can't yell, but here's what I can do. I can pray. Verse 11, And now behold the hand 
of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun. And I like, this is grace. This is grace of God for a time. Remember who was blinded earlier on in the book of Acts? Same guy. So he knows what it's like. He was heading a direction. And God gave him a Damascus road. And I pray, I fear for some of you. Have you had a Damascus road? Some of you are like, oh, just to have a Damascus. Damascus road is scary. I'd like to get it without just a nudging of the Spirit. Don't do that. Okay. Instead of, Mark, Mark, why persecutest thou me? <laughs> Blinded. I don't want that. I want to get it. This, this one who is a false prophet, even in God's grace, for a time, maybe he'll get it. Maybe Bar Jesus will get it. This is the graciousness of God. But let's not push him. Husband, wife, father, mother, child, don't push it. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Since you want to be people to be spiritually blind, you will be physically blind. And right then he's blinded, and he needs help getting around. God can take care of the buddy that attaches themselves to these people. Last verse here, verse 12. It's important theology in this verse. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred. And if, it, if the Bible just ended there without the comma that I have my, in mind and the phrase that continued, it could be something that is, is not good. Because it could be that experience was the thing that, that did the change in Serge's Paulus' Paulus's life. Because there's people looking for experiences all over. Ah, if you, I'll believe it if this happens and that. But, but it's, it's not just this experience of the blinding of this person, but look what impacts him. And this is, why, this is why we're preaching through the Word. This is why we have Bible studies here. This is why when Awana, they're memorizing verses, because there's power in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. This is what's changed. The gospel is what changes lives. Look at, he says, when he saw what had occurred, comma, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The word of God is what's going to change hearts and lives. And so as you and I are reading it, and I'm going to keep encouraging you, keep reading it. Memorize it as much as possible. If you need to, to um, make a card out. The other day I, in my wife's car, she had a, a, a card of a verse and she had taped it to the dashboard. And I said, well, what? I mean, not that that's like a bad thing, but I'm just saying, what's this? What's, what's up? And that, that's the verse that she needed as truth to hammer home something for her these past few days. And so instead of just thinking, I'll just get lucky that somehow God will throw these thoughts in my brain, here's, a, here's an idea. If you are struggling with something, if you are dealing with an issue, would you get out a card, find a verse or a passage or something, not just a quote by Rudyard Kipling, which would be, wouldn't be bad, but that's natural, but that you'd have that scripture and put it in a place that would impact your life. <coughs> Some of you, maybe that's the mirror in the morning. Maybe that's your notebook, young people. Maybe it is your dashboard. I don't know. And let the truth of God hammer home. And then when the enemy of your soul is talking to you, you can remind him, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And there's the truth that battles you. Jesus didn't give him a knuckle sandwich when, they, when the temptation came. He quoted scripture. It is when he saw what occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord.
That's why we're putting scriptures and, and things in here so that ultimately when these make it, it's nice that they get a doll. It's nice that they have all these things. But guess what? What's the most important thing is that lives are changed because of a philosophy that is lying to them. That's why yesterday when Trish and her group did all that work, there are people that are showing up that could care less about Jesus Christ. They just want turkey. They're hungry. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's real life. But guess what? They need something more. If all we ever did is just do meals for people, and, there's, and so there's a track left out there, and we're praying for these individuals that they would come. God, you've got to do something. So when they get to the gates, it isn't like, you know, I, I did go to one turkey dinner at that one church. Can I get in? It doesn't work that way. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's pray. Let's end.